Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonderful works or wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. Amen. Just hold there. We're going to talk about salvation. As I said last week, we're going to, all through the month of uh, March, we're going to talk about Jesus and what he did. And, and uh, um, as we approach Easter, um, and uh, try to have a good understanding of the work of Christ. Amen. As we go, I opened here because I, you know, I want to talk about salvation. When you, when you look at the scripture here, it's Jesus speaking. He says, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. In other words, not just because a man or a woman says Jesus is Lord. He says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord to me shall enter the kingdom of heaven or literally go to heaven. So he's saying there's a segment of people that say Lord or call him Lord, that live their lives calling him Lord, but they're not going to see heaven. Okay, so we want to figure out why, right? It says, but he who does what? The will of my Father, which is in heaven. And he goes on this again, and if I were you, I would circle many, will say to me in that day, well, what day? In the day of judgment. Many will say to me, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonderful works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of, uh, uh, of, or practice of lawlessness. And so we see here, who are these people? You know, and I have to tell you, when I first came into Christianity, at, you know, uh, first year, this section, there's two or three sections of scriptures that really shocked me. And this was one of them. Because, you know, when you look at this, we've, we've made it so easy in our minds to paint a picture of what salvation is. These folks right here, who he's talking about, and he doesn't say a few, he says many, believe while they're on earth that they have eternal security. They believe here on earth that they're doing the Lord's work. They're, they said, have we not done these things in your name, right? Recounting the, 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 the power that may have flown through them to touch others. They, they felt secure, they, they thought they were believers, and at this point, judgment comes when your heart stops, right? You, you know the tally of the score at that point. And he says that many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, and they're not going to make heaven. So why? We have to look at, we have to, you have to honestly look at the scripture and, and say how, why, what, where, what happened here? You know, how could they be so far off? Well, I want you to see, Jesus said, I never knew you, which means I never had a relationship with you. I, I, you, know, you had a relationship in your mind with me, but I never had a relationship with you. Okay, <clears throat> when you back up from that, he says two things. He says, those that hear and do the will of my Father in heaven, right, will what? See heaven, which means they weren't doing God's word. They weren't, they weren't doing what God told them to do. You know, let's look at it again so you see it. It says many, verse, 20, verse uh, 21, not everyone that says to me, Jesus, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So they did not do the will of God. Okay, they didn't do the will of God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many works in your name? Second issue, they're taking credit for the power. They're saying, did we not do this? Well, I can't heal anybody. Neither can you. But God can through us, right? So, so they're misguided in their thinking. And then it goes on, and I will declare to you, I never knew you depart from me, you who what? 
practice lawlessness, disobey the word of God, okay? So when you back up from this, they had faith in themselves. They didn't have the proper faith in who Jesus Christ was. And they went about playing Christianity. This is a dangerous thing, right? Because there's no turning this around. So, you know, we want to find out today, you know, the truth. Because I don't, I don't care if, if people are offended at the word. The word is truth. You, 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 at some point, I pray that you accept it as truth. This is the only way that we can find out what's right and wrong and what, what gets you there and what doesn't get you there. So what does salvation mean? First of all, let's look at, let's go over to Luke 16. Let's look at what, start to begin to look at what salvation is. Do you think they were surprised at the end of their life? Yeah. yeah, it's almost like the 42 virgins with the other group, right? <laughs> I mean, you had it wrong. You had it wrong. <laughs> Verse 19, uh, Luke 16, 19. It says, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was late at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man died also and was buried, and being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes. He saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tips of his fingers in water, cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this place. Now just stop there for a second. There's a bunch of things I want you to see. Both of these men died physically. Okay? Both of them <coughs> were Jews. He called them Father Abraham. He calls them Father Abraham three times which means he sees him as his father. Both of them are Jews. Both of them have the ability to gain salvation through what was then the Bible, the Old Testament. And so while both of them died and both of them had funerals on earth, their life continued. Their existence continued. One went to one section of hell and one went to the other section of hell. There's two sections. Abraham's bosom is called paradise, and then there's this place of torment, okay? So the Bible tells us that, that these two lives had two very different outcomes. One is in torment and is still there today, to this day. He's still there. He's still in torment. 2,000 years later, he's still there. And will stay there for eternity. So I didn't make the rules. I didn't write the Bible, okay? So, so when, we, when we look at this, what causes this outcome after death? What what, who makes this decision? And I can tell you right now, it's not man. The rules that drive this decision are made by God, regardless of how smart humanity thinks they are. They can have no effect in deciding where they go. Only God does. And, and if, if man tries to change it or modify it or think about it differently, they're sticking their head in the sand. There's one way to heaven, and we want to look at it. So, so these two guys had a different outcome. One was saved from torment, you'll see, and one fell into torment. Now think of this rich man. He's the guy that would drive to the synagogue in his Cadillac. He, had, he probably had hundreds of people at his funeral. The mayor probably spoke. They had more flowers than you can imagine. People knew him. He's the guy when they needed a well built, he gave the $10,000, right? He was notable. He was known. He was wealthy. And at the moment of death, both of these guys were naked on a slab. And Abraham says, you're going to see in your lifetime you made your decision on where you're going. In fact, if you read on, it says, and Abraham said, verse 25, son, remember, 
in your lifetime you receive good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those pass to us. In other words, this decision is final. Nobody's going to come give you relief from this side. It's over. Then he said, I beg you again, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that are left behind on earth. I'm ad, you know, amplifying it. That he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. What does verse 29 mean? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the word of God. That's what he's saying. They have the word of God. And he said, no father Abraham. Again, he calls him father. But if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one who rises from the dead. Okay? So, you know, when you, when you look at the story, it, it's... it's it, it, in some ways, it gives you comfort that after we die, we not only know who we are, we can reason with who we left behind. We can remember what's going on. We know who we are, right? And, and so we don't go to some blob, but we continue in our existence. So while there's crying at the funeral, right, there, these guys existed. <laughs> now, he wanted him to go back to his five brothers on earth because he probably figured they're coming here too. Right? You know, go back and tell my five brothers, I don't want them to experience this. And Abraham said they have the word of God. That's his answer to them. They have the word of God. They have to believe that word of God. Amen? And, and so we see here that after death, at the point of death, as a Christian, we believe in an afterlife. We believe that you go to one place or the other. We, a man did not develop this. God developed this. Okay? God created hell for those that are disobedient to him. And he created heaven for those who are obedient to him. And, and, and so we, you know, today's message is, are you sure you're going to heaven? You know? So let's look at, uh, let's look at, um, you know, uh, go over to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Now let me ask you a question. The rich man is in torment today and the poor man is in heaven with Jesus today. Did anything they do on earth economically change that outcome? Does the rich man's money mean anything to him now? He'd give it all to buy a cup of water, it seems like, right? So go over to Romans, Romans chapter 5. In verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die, but perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners or separate or spiritually dead, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received uh, reconciliation, therefore, just as through one man's sin, that's Adam, 
the world and death. Sin entered the world and death through sin and the death spread to all men because all have sinned. So here we have, if you, if you look at this, the Bible's telling us that, that God demonstrated his love. Now here, let's, let's, let's rise above all of this. We're going to get to the part in, in the teaching today where God is the creator of all things. Okay, either you believe God created all things or you don't. So if God created all things, then God has the authority to make the rules that govern his creation. And then God has the ability to judge his creation based on his rules. So if you toss the message out today, you're tossing God out today. Okay? So God is the creator of all things, and because he's the creator of all things, he sets up the authority and the rules that govern his creation as he intends. And then he has the ability to judge as he would the word of God in the earth. So in man's fall, what this is saying, because man was broken, because man was unrighteous, in fact, in verse 12 it says, therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men. So every man born of the male seed carries in him a death sentence. He's guilty before God. He's unrighteous before God. He, in the eyes of God, he is an enemy. Okay? But the Bible says that God demonstrated his love by providing a sacrifice in Jesus. Now, think about, you have to understand God. He is righteous and holy, which means he will do what's necessary to do it right, righteously and holy. So he, to accomplish our salvation, he had to do it in a way that satisfied his laws and satisfied every other created being in the universe, spiritual or physical. So no one could complain or make an attack at him. So when you look at the Bible, he, God had to do it in a way where Satan and all of the fallen angels could never make an attack on his character or what he did. You follow? So, so we have to make an assumption that he will do enough to get it done. And what was needed was someone born outside of Adam's transgression to live a sinless life that would be holy enough and righteous enough to be, to stand in our stead and be falsely judged with our sins put on him so that he would be judged and he would go into the depths of the earth and hell for you and for me and God would resurrect him up and with that our faith in him would bring us salvation. That's sort of an oversimplification of the next three scriptures we're going to look at but but you, you have to understand, this is one of the hardest things for a human being to get their arms around, is that all seven billion people on the face of the earth need salvation. My, my seven children have to make their own decision. Why? Because they were born of me, right, my seed. As a result of it, it you know, they have to find their own righteous relationship with God because they're born in sin. A father cannot make up for his children or, or a mom. They have to make that decision themselves. So the Bible says here that God put together a plan that would, and you see the words here, that would justify, which means taking a guilty man's file and saying the debt is paid. That's justified. We're reconciled. That means whatever was lacking has been reconciled out and the, the books are balanced and now that person's free. Yeah, they've, been, they've been saved. Twice he uses the word saved. Saved from what? Saved from going with the rich man. Saved from going to who? The rich man, right? So in other words, everybody's heading where the rich man's going. Everybody. And saved means one plucked out of the fire, moved over to the other side, okay? So, so we see that. We see that. You know, when you go back, if you go back, go back to Genesis...
Genesis chapter 2. In verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall what? Surely die. And it literally says two deaths. In dying, you will die. So he has a commandment that there's this tree in the midst of the garden not to eat from. We, you know, that it's not an apple tree. It's, it, it, it's, it's a tree that has been blocked now from man getting to it. Chapter 3, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you what? Die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, God's knowing good and evil. So the woman saw the tree was good for food. It was pleasant to the eye, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, ate. She gave also to her husband with her. He did eat. The eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves aprons. Essentially, what did they do? What, what triggered this mass of chaos in the earth? They disobeyed God's word. It's just as true today as it was then. You have to understand, a disobedience of God's word brings death. It, 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 it brings spiritual death. It brings, it brings many, many things on humanity. Nothing has changed. Even this year, 2018, sin brings death. Okay? Now, we, we, we have a relationship, and therefore the Bible says that if we repent, which means turn back to the light and confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But it's, I'm going to tell you, it's still all about sin. It still is all today, it's still about sin. Satan's message was there's no consequence to breaking God's word. What did they do? They broke God's word. What happened? The word was true, and the word judged them. In other words, God made the command. God didn't come in and judge them. Their disobedience to the word judged them. Do you guys see that? It's the same thing in the earth today. When you disobey God, you open the door to Satan, but there is judgment attached to it. You know, it, you, know you look at David, a God, man after God's own heart. His sins caused him havoc on the earth. It, it caused him, you know, great harm on the earth. Today, the modern day American Christian believes that because you're an American, you're close to God, which is nonsense, right? But they also believe that they're good with God because most of them were born in a Christian family, which is not a birthright. It's not a bloodline. It's not. And that gives you a false sense of security. That gives you, I mean, being born in a Christian family helps, definitely helps, right? Because you're going to church and you're learning the word of God. But, but that child still has to make a decision for themselves or they can go through life deceived, thinking they're good, thinking they're volunteering, just because they were born in a Christian family. And the other side of it is, somebody says a prayer in a parking lot 35 years ago and think, thinks they joined a club forever. Both are nonsense in the scripture. Both are nonsense in the scripture. There is a responsibility on the believer to begin to obey the word of God. You, you, just, you just can't say you believe in God and don't believe him. So what Adam and Eve did here is they had a creator. He had the authority over his creation. He made a rule and a regulation for them. 
He had the ability to judge them. They, between themselves and with Satan's uh, temptation, disobeyed the word of God and paid the price. Simple math, right? It's the same today. There's nothing that changed. There's nothing that changed, okay? What's changed is our position in God's eyes and our position in Jesus Christ. Because all of us, even though we're believers, we still sin. We still do. I mean, we're, the idea is to clean it up, to get better about it, right? So as we're moving toward Christ, we're beginning to peel back the onion and we're beginning to get rid of the sins in our life. We're beginning to change and conform into the image of Christ, but it's a lifelong journey. It's not, it's not over or with a prayer. It's a lifelong journey, okay? So, so when you look at the word, let's just look at the word. Uh, let's, well, let's look at the big picture. Go over to Ephesians chapter 2. You know what? Go to John 17. I want to I jump into what is salvation. Jesus, in his closing prayer, gives a good picture of what salvation is. In verse 5, he says, And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name.